In this section, I'm going to briefly discuss the application of the Laplace transform to circuit analysis. Earlier in the context of the Fourier transform, we discussed circuit analysis at some length. As part of this discussion, we were introduced to some fundamentals of electronic circuits, including three basic circuit elements known as resistors, inductors, and capacitors. Since the slide that we're currently viewing and the next several slides, which provide background on electronic circuits, are identical to the ones that were presented in the earlier unit on the Fourier transform, I won't go through these slides in any detail here. I'll simply draw to your attention the fact that these slides were covered earlier, and you can refer to this earlier discussion if necessary. In what follows, I'll assume that the viewer is familiar with this basic material on electronic circuits covered earlier, and jump directly into the material that relates to the use of the Laplace transform for circuit analysis. At this point, I'm going to skip over the slides that are identical to the ones that were covered earlier. In particular, I'm going to skip this slide, and this slide, and this slide, and this slide. As it turns out, the Laplace transform is a very useful tool for analyzing circuits, especially when inductors and capacitors are involved. The utility of the Laplace transform is partly due to the fact that the differential and integral equations that characterize inductors and capacitors become much simpler when expressed in the Laplace domain instead of the time domain. To illustrate this point, let's consider what the equations characterizing a resistor, an inductor, and a capacitor look like in the Laplace domain. To this end, let little v and little i respectively denote the voltage across and current through a circuit element, and let big V and big I denote the Laplace transforms of little v and little i respectively. In the Laplace domain, the equations characterizing a resistor, an inductor, and a capacitor respectively become these three equations here. What's particularly noteworthy about these equations is that they don't contain any differentiation or integration operations. Recall that in the time domain, the equations that characterize inductors and capacitors involve derivatives or integrals. In the Laplace domain, however, no differentiation or integration operations are present. In effect, these operations have been replaced by multiplication and division by the Laplace transform variable s. Clearly, this makes equations involving inductors and capacitors much easier to handle in the Laplace domain than in the time domain. And herein lies one of the major benefits of using the Laplace transform for circuit analysis. At this point, I'd like to consider an example of using the Laplace transform to analyze a simple electronic circuit. In particular, I'd like to consider example 7.38. In this example, we're given an electronic circuit that's LTI and consists of a single resistor and single capacitor connected in the manner shown in this figure here. The input of the system is the voltage little v1, in other words, the voltage between this point in the circuit here and this point in the circuit here. The output of the system is the voltage little v2, in other words, the voltage between this point in the circuit here and this point in the circuit here. In this example, we're asked to do three things. In part A, we're asked to find the system function big H of the system. In part B, we're asked to determine whether the system is bibostable. And in part C, we're asked to determine the step response of the system. As the first step in the solution process, we're going to write some equations that characterize the behavior of the system in the time domain. To make this easier to do, we're going to first label the circuit diagram with the voltage drop across the resistor and the current passing through the capacitor. First, let's consider the voltage drop across the resistor, in other words, this resistor here. Recall that the voltage drop across a resistor is equal to the resistance of the resistor times the current passing through the resistor. In this case, the resistance of the resistor is R, and the current passing through the resistor is little i. So the voltage drop across the resistor will simply be given by the product of r 
and little i, as given in this annotation here. Now let's consider the current passing through the capacitor, in other words, this capacitor here. Recall that the current passing through a capacitor is equal to the capacitance of the capacitor times the derivative of the voltage across the capacitor. In this case, the capacitance of the capacitor is C, and the voltage across the capacitor is little v2. So the current through the capacitor is the product of C and the derivative of little v2, as given in this annotation here. With the preceding quantities in the circuit diagram now labeled, it's relatively easy to write some equations that characterize the behavior of this system. First consider the voltage drop between this point in the circuit here and this point in the circuit here. By definition, this voltage is equal to little v1. This voltage, however, is also equal to the sum of the voltage drop across this resistor here and the voltage drop across this capacitor here. By equating these two quantities, we obtain equation 7.14a, in other words, this equation here. Next, consider the current passing through this capacitor here. This current is equal to little i, and is also equal to c times the derivative of little v2. By equating these two quantities, we obtain equation 7.14b, in other words, this equation here. The next step in the solution is to take the Laplace transform of each of the equations 7.14a and 7.14b, in other words, these two equations here. First, let's consider taking the Laplace transform of equation 7.14a, in other words, this equation here. To take the Laplace transform of this equation, we simply use the linearity property of the Laplace transform. This yields equation 7.15a, in other words, this equation here. Next, let's consider taking the Laplace transform of equation 7.14b, in other words, this equation here. To take the Laplace transform of this equation, we use the differentiation property of the Laplace transform. This yields equation 7.15b, in other words, this equation here. At this point, we observe that the system function big H that we're seeking is given by the Laplace transform of the output of the system divided by the Laplace transform of the input of the system. In other words, big V2 divided by big V1. Therefore, we want to somehow use equations 7.15a and 7.15b in order to find an expression for big V2 divided by big V1. To this end, we choose to eliminate the variable big I. We do this by substituting equation 7.15b, in other words, this equation here, into equation 7.15a, in other words, this equation here. Doing this yields this particular equation here. Next, by straightforward algebraic manipulation, we can rewrite this equation in this particular form here. So now we have a formula for big V2 divided by big V1. At this point, we can observe that because the system is LTI, it's characterized by an equation of this form here shown in the annotation. In particular, we have that the Laplace transform of the output of the system, which is denoted as big V2, is equal to the Laplace transform of the input of the system, which is denoted as big V1, times the system function of the system, which is denoted as big H. Rearranging this equation to solve for big H gives us big H is equal to big V2 over big V1. So in this expression here, where we have big V2 over big V1, we can replace this by big H, which gives us this next equation here. At this point, I'm going to pause in order to scroll the example upwards so that we can see the next part of the solution. Now we continue from where we left off on this line here. First, we can divide the numerator and denominator by RC. This gives us this next line here. 
Then we can rewrite the denominator slightly to show explicitly the pole. In particular, we have a pole at minus 1 over RC. So now we have an algebraic expression for big H, but we still need to find the region of convergence for big H. So if big H is a rational function with a single pole at minus 1 over RC, this particular function can have a region of convergence which is a left half plane to the left of the pole, or a right half plane to the right of the pole. But because this system is physically realizable, in other words, we can build it, it must be causal. Because it's causal, it must have a right half plane region of convergence. So the region of convergence must be this green shaded region. In other words, we have this particular region of convergence here. So now we've completed part A of the example, which asks us to find big H. Now we proceed to part B of the example. Recall that in part B, we're asked to determine whether the system is bibostable. This could be easily determined from the region of convergence of big H, in other words, from this region of convergence here. Because R and C are strictly positive quantities, minus 1 over RC must be strictly negative, meaning that this point minus 1 over RC must be strictly to the left of the imaginary axis. Therefore, this region of convergence shown in green must include the imaginary axis. Therefore, the system is stable. At this point, I'm going to flip to the next page so that we can proceed to part C of the example. Now we proceed to part C of the example. Recall that in part C we're asked to find the step response of the system. To begin, we recall from earlier that the system is described by this particular equation here, where the system function big H we've already found in part A. So we can substitute the system function we found earlier into this equation to obtain this next line here. Now, because in the case of the step response, the input to the system is the unit step function, we're going to substitute for big V1 the Laplace transform of the unit step function, which is given by 1 over S. So this gives us this next line here. Then we can divide the numerator and denominator by RC, which gives us this next line. And at this point, we want to take the inverse Laplace transform of big V2. To do this, we're going to use a partial fraction expansion of big V2. And we can observe that in this particular expression for big V2 that we have here, which is fully factored, the function big V2 has two simple poles, one at 0 coming from this first factor s, and one at minus 1 over rc coming from this factor s plus 1 over rc. Because there's two simple poles, each pole will contribute a single term to the partial fraction expansion which means the partial fraction expansion for big V2 has this general form here, where A1 and A2 are coefficients to be determined. So now we proceed to find these partial fraction expansion coefficients. Since each of these coefficients are associated with simple poles, we use the partial fraction expansion coefficient formula for the case of simple poles. So this is what we substitute into on this line here for A1, and on this line here for A2. And then when we grind through the arithmetic, we get a value of 1 for the coefficient A1 and a value of minus 1 for the coefficient A2. So if we now substitute these values in to this equation here for our partial fraction expansion, this yields this line here, which is our partial fraction expansion for big V2. At this point, I'm going to pause in order to scroll the example upwards so that we can see the remainder of the solution. Now we continue from where we left off on this line here. At this point, we want to take the inverse Laplace transform of big V2. When we do this, this trivially gives us this next line here, where we now have two inverse Laplace transforms that we need to compute. This inverse Laplace transform here, and this inverse Laplace transform here. These inverse Laplace transforms can be easily handled by using a Laplace transform table. However, we need to choose the region of convergence for each of these algebraic expressions involved in the inverse Laplace transform operations.
In order to do this, we simply observe that this, because the system that we're dealing with is causal, the region of convergence for 1 over s and 1 over s plus 1 over rc should be right half planes. So bearing this in mind, we can look up the inverse Laplace transforms in our table, and we end up with these inverse Laplace transforms indicated in the annotation here. And if we substitute these inverse Laplace transforms into this equation here, what we obtain is this next line here, which can be simply rewritten as this next line, which is our final answer.